this morning, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees for he heard them reasoning and he was displeased. The Pharisees were displeased with what they saw for the Pharisees, as you know, were the religious leaders of the day. So in other words, they knew the law in and out, and they knew that as Jews, they, it was disdain for them to speak with non-Jews. It was disdain for them to mingle with, with publicans and sinners. Or, and so when they saw Jesus, who in the flesh was a Jew, when they saw him coming to Matthew, who was a tax collector, and they said, follow me, they looked at him and said, who does this man think that he is? Does he not know our traditions? Does he not know that this man is a publican, he's a, a sellout, if you will? Does he not know who this man is and why you know, he preaches and, and speaks with such authority seemingly, but yet he, he spends time with the lowest of the low according to our tradition? And so the Pharisees came to the disciples and they said, why is your master, why is your leader eating with these publicans and these sinners? And so in hearing it, Jesus said something profound. He said, they that be whole need not a physician, right. but they that are sick. That's right. And when he made this statement, he sent them back to the scripture. He said, in other words, you say you know the scripture so much, so go back and take a look. Go back and take a look and figure out what it means when I say I would have mercy and not sacrifice. Amen. And that's the second text that we read this morning. See, sometimes we think we know something. For the Pharisees, they spent their day in, day out studying the word. So they were they were fluent in the scriptures. They knew inside and out. They could tell you probably line and verse, have it memorized inside and out. It's like Hebrew, Aramaic, how many different languages. They could tell you exactly what the scripture said. Right. But it's one thing to know what something says. And it's another thing to know what something means. And so in the passage that we read in Hosea, we hear the cry coming from the Lord on behalf of his people. And the cry is coming to the people, rather, and saying, Oh, Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? In other words, what am I going to do with you? What, what am I going to do with you? Oh, Judah, you whose name means praise. To praise means to exalt, to give, to extol, to, to give due honor and recognition for. So you who means praise, what am I to do with you? For you see, in this portion, in this chapter, when you read the book of Hosea, it's, it's a, a great, so, you know, I always talk about object lessons, and the Lord is the greatest object lessons, for he uses natural things that we can understand yes. to paint a picture of spiritual things that we have a hard time struggling with. That's right. And here, Hosea was told by the Lord to go and marry a prostitute. Oh, no. Now, when you hear that, you're kind of like, oh. Exactly. What? 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 You, you, you know, at first, it, it seems so contrary. It seems so opposite to what the Lord. You know, we always think about the Lord being a good God. It seems so opposite to, to what He would want for His people to go and marry a prostitute. But what the Lord was doing, He was making a point. He said, "Listen, I, I'm showing you what you have done to me as a nation, as a people. I'm showing you how you've committed whoredoms against me. I, I'm using this object lesson, Hosea and his." Prostituting wife to, to show you what you've done. That's right. And as we come to this part in the scripture, the Lord, you can almost imagine the exasperation for when you read in the earlier chapters of Hosea, there's a, a beautiful love story and this, this going back and forth about the Lord with his great love wanting to draw the children of Israel. And Hosea chapter 3 tells a, a beautiful story about how he wants to take his lover away from her idols and take her to the wilderness and speak sweet nuts, sweet things into her ear to provide for her, to, to take care of her. I mean, you laugh, but the Lord is the greatest romantic that there ever was. You know, there's no play, no, no player that can outdo the Lord, for he is the greatest romantic that there is. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so there's this, when you read it, I encourage you to read it. It's a beautiful pastor, and he's talking about wanting to whisk away his lover, away from uh, the ones that she's committed hoarders with, these other gods and these other idols that she's fooled around with and played the field with because she thought she could find something better. And there's this beautiful account of how he wants to take her away and remove their names out of her mouth. And not just bring her to herself, but bring her to a place where she no longer calls him master, right. but she calls him is she, which means oh. husband. Oh, yeah. oh. See, there's, there's an intimacy in that. There's no greater and more intimate relationship than between a man and his wife. Praise the 
And, and you know, we sometimes we, we turn away from our thoughts from these things because we think it's carnal, but the Lord is giving us a, an object lesson so that we can understand the great relationship that He desires to have That's with right. us. Oh the great lover desires one to love. love. And he's taken us from the opposite side of the tracks, you will. And we who are who are distraught, who are unlovable, who were had nothing to offer. He said, Listen, I, I'm not looking at you as the way you are now, but I see what you can be. I, I see who you are, I see you and the, and the potential that you have. I see what I want to do with you. I want to clothe you in righteousness. I want to array you in my splendor and in my glory. Go ahead. That's right. But even the Lord has standards. See, you, you can't be living in the palace and still act like a tramp. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Jesus. You can't live in the palace and be royalty and still act like your $2 hooker sitting on the side of the street. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. For there is a way that one must carry themselves that is befitting of their state. There's a way that one must carry themselves that is befitting of who they are. And so many times we allow, you know, even in our own personal lives, we act so much as the person we were because we allow that past to, to tattoo itself on our hearts. And we think that we are really this person. But when you come into the kingdom, you are a new creature. That is something valuable that comes from right, right, right. something treasured yeah. for no longer are we trash but now we become Trading. his personal treasure yeah. his personal value his personal possession yes. for him to use as he sees yes. Amen. That's right. but as the Lord was going through and speaking through the prophet Hosea there is a lament after this this story, this beautiful love story of coming away and bringing his bride into the wilderness and speaking sweet things to her ear and providing her everything that she needs. There's a lament. For you see, by the time we get to chapter 6, he's saying, listen, how many times do I need to tell you who you are? How many times do I need to come and to rescue you out of your state? How many times are you going to come back to me and then as soon as things are okay, you're going to turn back to these God, idols? Jesus. The Lord is saying, listen, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this. Listen, I, you know, I want to deliver. I want, to, I want you to be my bride. Right. But you can't keep going and making yourself a whore with these other idols. You can't keep going and prostituting yourself to these idols and giving away what must be mine to somebody else. Right. Lord, say you belong to me, but yes. when you give yourselves and all that you have to these idols, you are prostituting yourself. Right. And you're giving away that valuable treasure and you're bringing it to naught. Oh but I started to question, I'm like, Lord, okay, the, you know, the vivid imagery of this prostitution, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, the, the streets of New York City and seeing, you know, the blood on the sidewalk and seeing just a, a despicable place. I'm saying, how did a people who are Lord's chosen people, how did they get to a place where they end up prostituting themselves? You know, Israel, when you think of the name Israel, it means one who has power with God and man. So this is not just some ordinary group of people. But we read about how in Exodus, the Lord said, I, I desire to take you out from amongst these people. Not because, he specified, not because you're so special. Not because of anything you've done. But because I desire you. Because I want you. And I'm going to make you a priesthood. I'm going to make you a nation of priests. What you have to understand is priests were ones who were consecrated to accomplish the work of the Lord. They had a special charge. And their charge was to take care of the holy things. Their charge was to make sacrifice on behalf of the people. Their responsibility was to be uh, the intermediaries, if you will, on behalf of the people. So they had a responsibility, and this is what the Lord said that he desired to make of Israel, a nation of priests, a nation of people set apart. And yet this nation of people who were set apart found themselves on the corner selling their wares 
Mm. Identification by association. Mm. They found themselves on the corner, oh giving away their valuable treasure for next to nothing. Oh my God. Mm. So as he comes in Hosea chapter six, he says, "Listen, Ephraim, yeah. you were supposed to be fruitful. Oh, Jesus. What am I to do with you? Mm. For the fruit you bear is supposed to be mine, but." Yet your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goes away. In other words, it doesn't last. It's not lasting. It's not enduring like it's supposed to be. He says, and I read for them, the New Living Translation says, For your love vanishes like the morning mist and disappears like dew in the sunlight. Oh my God. Jesus. In other words, there's nothing of substance there. You say it all the time that you love me because you come and you bring these sacrifices all the time. You, you do what I've asked you to do and you, you bring the sacrifices, but yet there's no substance behind it. Because right. after you bring the sacrifices further down, it says your priests hang out like, uh, like a, a crew on the side ready to kill anyone who comes by, ready to murder. You know, I, I, like I said, the Bible is so beautiful in imagery. And as I was reading this passage, I kind of was getting a modern day picture and seeing, like I said, the streets of New York City, you can, if you close your eyes with me this morning, you can see in the, the back alleys of, of some hole in the Bronx, and you see the you know, trash cans everywhere, and you see blood on the streets, you hear the sirens, you, you smell the, the stench of, of all the residue and mildew that was there, and you see, I see these priests who are supposed to be these chosen people, who are supposed to be doing the work, but they were cavorting, hiding in the shadows, just waiting for somebody to come by. Just waiting for someone to come like a band of robbers, waiting to ambush them. Mm. Waiting to kill. Yes, yes. And as I started to get this visual, I said, how, how could this be? How, how have the righteous fallen? How have this people who the Lord desired to take away, mm. to make his own, how have they fallen oh, nice. into such degradation? Wow. For they had all the outward signs. They were still giving the sacrifices as they always had. You know, we've been talking about sacrifice in our last few lessons in Sunday school. They've been great lessons. I encourage you to come to Sunday school and see what we've said when we looked. We're looking to the Bible to get a definition. And so when we looked at the definition of sacrifice, about what the word says about sacrifice, we discovered that to sacrifice is to offer in service to the Lord as he requires a substitution for uh, in place of destruction or death. And it's something to be to be offered as stipulated by God. In other words, something that the Lord requires. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, we see the passages are laden with what God requires. We talked about it this morning. He's very specific yes. right. in what he asks for. Yes. So if he said to sprinkle the altar seven times with the blood of the goat, you better sprinkle the altar seven times with the blood of the goat. Not eight times, not six times, but seven times. Why? Because what the Lord dictates is what he expects. But there's a reason for what the Lord asks. See, we don't always understand. But I'm here to tell you that understanding or comprehension is not a prerequisite for obedience. Let me say that again, that comprehension is not a prerequisite for obedience. I'm going to say it one more time so it sinks in. Comprehension is not a prerequisite for obedience. In other words, we don't always understand why the Lord asks us to do what he asks us. We don't always get it. And that's okay. We're not expected to get everything. For his ways are higher than our ways and it's not so much beyond our thoughts. So how can we really comprehend what it asks? And it's only after the fact when we turn around and say, okay, now I get it. But comprehension is not a prerequisite. My God. Or, yeah, comprehension is not a prerequisite for obedience. For if we trust the Lord, as we sing all the time that we do, then we know that everything works together for good to them that love him and who are the called according to his purpose. But you see, there's something key in there because he said, all things work together for good to them that love. To them that love. To them that love. 